Hey everybody, this is a continuation of our lecture series on phase one metabolism reactions. Um, we've got kind of went through some of the different options like like oxidative dealkylations and things like that. Um, and where we left off last time was S, uh, direct oxidation, so direct oxidation of sulfur. And we, sh we showed this slide basically that one of the things that sulfides can do, uh, this functional group, is just like, the, just like the other things like oxygen and nitrogen, um, they can direct, they can, they can do a P450 mediated oxidative dealkylation. So the carbon is oxidized to this hemithioacetal, electrons kick off, and a thiol is produced. So we saw this last time. And the byproduct is formaldehyde. Um, and then the other thing that can happen is um, uh, a direct oxidation. So rather than oxidizing the carbon, we can oxidize the sulfur. An example is thioridazine, which is an antipsychotic drug. Uh, and these use FMO, the flavin monooxygenase enzymes, instead of P450. And in this case, uh, both sulfides are oxidized to sulfoxides. Um, here is an example of oxycerin in, in immunosuppressant, which is actually contains a ketone and a sulfoxide and in this case it's FMO and it oxidizes the sulfoxide to a sulfone functional group. So these are a couple of the different um, uh, sulfur oxidations you can do and th this is using F the FMO enzyme system. Okay so then another uh, thing that can happen is the oxidation of thiocarbonyls which are um, C double bond S groups. Uh, here's an example of thiopentel, which is a uh, one of the barbiturate um, drugs. It's like a painkiller sedative hypnotic drug, you often used in surgery and um, other other uses. Anyway, so FMO will actually oxidize the C double bond S to this sort of C double bond S single bond oxygen with a negative charge on it. And this is called an activated sulfur. And it is readily hydrolyzed because now water can attack the carbon and, and kick this th whole thing off. This is also what we call an RSCC, a resonance stabilized carbocation. So water, if we imagine water, could just directly attack this, kick the electrons onto sulfur, and then, you know, through another step or two, kick this thing off as a uh, leaving group. And that would get, turn essentially thiopentyl into pentobarbital, which is no another sedative. So this is a case where one barbiturate is converted to another barbiturate, and they're both active. So, yeah, this stuff happens all the time in the body. Okay, and uh, another class of reactions. Notice we went through uh, oxidation and oxidative dealkylation. Let's talk about reduction transformations that can happen to drugs. <coughs> it's one of the prevalent reactions that can happen. Um, it's usually done with P450. Now, P450 is typically an oxidizing uh, enzyme. And when P450 is used in reductions, you need a cofactor, a, a reducing cofactor. And the, that cofactor is usually going to be NADPH. It's, uh, and the H lets you know that it's, it's redu reductive. Usually reductions are NADH and NADPH. Or they, it uses those cofactors. Okay, so let's show a couple simple examples. Well, this is just the general idea. You can imagine a ketone being reduced to a secondary alcohol with P450 and NADPH. Um, you could also imagine like a nitro group, uh, RNO2, reacting with P450 and NADPH in a reduction to a uh, primary amine. 
Uh, one that we're not going to show, but uh, it's totally uh, totally happens, and it's pretty easy to understand. Is an azide. So imagine R and triple bond N, and then that oxi- or, uh, reduces to R and H two also. So tr- uh, azides, azides R tr- and triple bond N reduces also to primary amines. And we do know of azide drugs, right? Like uh, zytovudine, which is AZT. It's the um, um, the HIV reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And there's other drugs also that have azides in them. Okay, so uh, one thing about reduction of carbonyls and like reduction of a ketone is that can cr- create a new chiral center. And that uh, and whenever you use enzymes to do reactions and you're creating a new chiral center, uh, you, you will always um, potentially have um, an, uh, stereo control. So the enzyme will not just haphazardly reduce the ketone and make a mixture, like a racemic mixture. It'll often make individuals and in antimers. Here's an example. Naltrexone is one of these mu opioid antagonist drugs. So it has the kind of standard um, uh, opioid skeleton. So it's a pretty complicated molecule, alcohol, amine, ether, and then you have this ketone. And um, and so um, what happens with P450 under reducing conditions with an ADPH is the alcohol, the ketone gets reduced to a secondary alcohol. And there's two secondary alcohols that can be formed. They're, these are not enantiomers. These are diastereomers because the chirality is set in the rest of the molecule. And we have just one new chiral center either going away or coming towards us. Interestingly, and this is, you know, you see this stuff all the time in metabolism. There's a species dependence. And, for example, an altrexone administered to a chicken um, would uh, attach the hydride. The hydride, which is coming towards us, the OH is going away from us. But anyway, the, it produces this stereoisomer. And in rabbits and humans, randomly, the stereochemistry is opposite. So our P450 systems are slightly different between chickens and then in, in our case, as humans, our P450 for 50 is closer to rabbits than chickens. So, um, and, and of course, you know, we, we don't really have a pressing need to give opioid antagonists to chickens or rabbits, but the, the, these are species used to study P450 um, as model systems for humans. Okay. And then thereafter, these uh, secondary alcohols can be phase two metabolized. So we'll learn about phase two metabolism pretty sh- shortly, but you can attach other things. Other things get attached to these to aid in their excretion. And yes, the stereoselectivity is species dependent. Re- air, reduction of aromatic nitro compounds. We already talked about this a little bit. Uh, nitro compounds can be reduced. Uh, here's an example of clonazepam, which is clonapine. It's an anticonvulsant drug, kind of vaguely related to, I think, mm, maybe diazepam, yeah, which is uh, Valium. Um, anyways, it is a nitro group, an aromatic nitro group, and P450 under reducing conditions within ADPH reduces the nitro to a aromatic amine called an aniline. And then this can further undergo phase two metabolism as the acetate conjugate. So this gets acetylated. And yeah, we'll talk more about phase two. Interestingly, uh, an acetate doesn't necessarily aid into excretion, but it is used to inactivate the drug. And because when this gets changed to a different thing, this no longer has activity. Sorry, yeah, the the, the acetylated conjugate no longer has activity and that's a lot of the goal of metabolism is to deactivate xenobiotics or drugs reduction of an azo linkage so an azo linkage is r and double bond n r and 
Uh, this is a drug, uh, sulfasalazine or azufilidine EN, which is a, a ulcer treatment and also treats uh, rheumato rheumatoid arthritis. And so this azo-linked substance is reduced with P450 and NADPH. In this case, it's interesting because the two metabolites, which is kind of the left part and the right part, are actually both uh, drugs. Sulfopyridine and 5-aminosalicylic acid, which is kind of related to salicylic acid and, and aspirin derivatives. I think the sulfopyridine is a, um, a uh, maybe a sulfa drug like like a antibiotic through the folate metabolism like we talked about and this is a derivative of salicylic acid and i don't know what activity it does have but but here's a case where the azo linkage is cleaved to produce two active metabolites and yet this is another reductive pathway and uh this is also an example of a pro drug because uh, the drug is actually inactive in its initial state, but when it gets metabolized, it produces these two active metabolites, which are pharm pharmacologically active. It's also what you might call a co-drug, a co-drug being something that actually has two drugs built into it, and when it gets metabolized, it, it releases two drugs. And an azo linkage is a great way to do that, because you can just take two drugs, that maybe both have a NH2 on them. Imagine an azo-link drug, and you, there's ways to make these things. And then inside your body, both drugs get li liberated at the same location, which is kind of cool. Co-drug. All right, so hydrolytic metabolism, hydrolysis of functional groups now. Reduced oxidation, reduction now, hydrolysis. Uh, hydrolysis is carried out by uh, esterases and amidases. So these are soluble enzymes that are not related to P450 or FMO. They're present, present in, in the plasma, so in the blood, in the liver, kidney, and intestines. And it's not carried out by these other enzyme systems. Example, aspirin. So aspirin contains this ester functional group and the, uh, the CO bond can be cleaved. You know, in the laboratory, this is really easy. You'd use like sodium hydroxide as a nucleophile, but esterases cleave esters and they're, they're present everywhere in our body, in our blood and our various organs. Cocaine has a, um, it's kind of a weird uh, bridged, alkaloid system on the left with an N methyl. It actually has two esters, a methyl ester and a benzoyl, uh, benzoic acid derived ester. And the methyl ester is readily cleaved by esterases as a met metabolic route. Uh, malathion is a insecticide, so not necessarily a drug, but it also has metabolic um, routes to it. It has this weird P, P double bond S and a couple of these uh, phosphoester groups. Anyway, it has two different esters, one that's closer to the chiral center and one that's further from the chiral center. And both methyl esters, or sorry, ethyl esters, ethyl. Both ethyl esters are cleaved to give different uh, metabolites. As you can imagine, Hydrolysis occurs more rapidly with esters than amides. Um, esters are less stable. Amides are more stable. So in this case, a procaine, which is also called Novocaine, and it's a local anesthetic that is used very commonly in dentistry. Uh, this ester is actually pretty rapidly metabolized. And that um, uh, gets destroyed to basically to PABA, right? Because when when uh, this gets hydrolyzed, it's para-aminobenzoic acid. And 
something like this, which actually looks very um, similar, except you have an, an NH instead of an oxygen. It is an amide, and it's very slowly hydrolyzed. And this is a procanamid uh, or procanamid procanbid which is an anti-arrhythmic drug so pretty crazy different activities um, and a very different uh, metabolism and all due to the oxygen versus nitrogen so amides are slower to hydrolyze and we see that in the laboratory also amides are very slow and difficult to hydrolyze that's also remember very useful because our all of our proteins are built in amide linkages and if if our amides in our body, our proteins, were, were uh, very easily hydrolyzed, then our, our body could not exist and our proteins would all degrade. And yes, the uh, esters cleave preferentially. Oh, oh uh, sorry, wrong drug. This is a different drug. Different drug. This is uh, propranidid. This is procaine, am procaine amide. I'm sorry, I got my names messed up. Procaine amide and propranidid. And now in this case, it actually has a, an amide on the left and an ester on the right. And, the and uh, this amide is preserved and not hydrolyzed readily. The ester is rapidly hydrolyzed by uh, esterase uh, enzymes. Okay, let's get into phase two transformations now, which are kind of the follow-up to phase one transformations and addition of conjugate groups. So phase two metabolism consists of conjugation of small polar endogenous molecules to drugs. So it's a little uh, pieces of uh, molecules that are very common and we see all the time uh, get attached to drugs. And the final product is typically excreted in bile or, or urine. And they, uh, the polarity is usually enhanced, not always though. Conjugation reactions require an available nucleophile on the drug to serve as a site for conjugation. And sometimes it's re revealed by phase one metabolism. So an alcohol, an amine, a secondary amine, a thiol, et cetera. Uh, sometimes other conjugation reactions like glutathione, which we'll see. Uh, in glutathione, you're, uh, rather than scavenging a nucleophile, you're scavenging an electrophile. We'll see that one in a bit. Some of the phase two conjugates, one's called glucuronide, which is kind of kind of looks like glucose, except it's got a uh, carboxylic acid right there. Um, it attaches to alcohols uh, actu and actually carboxylic acids also and amines and thiols and all of those get kind of get attached right here where the squiggly line is. Sulfate is a conjugating group. It attaches to uh, alcohols and amines. Glycine and glutamine attach to carboxylic acids. So if your drug has a carboxylic acid in it, they can get conjugated with glycine or glutamine via a peptide type linkage and that enhances excretion because this is a, a polar derivative also. Um, we mentioned glutathione which is atta attaches to electrophilic atoms. So this is glutathione, uh, we call it GSH and when we say GSH we're saying it's a thiol, so it's a cysteine amino acid. And so, there, so as a nucleophilic uh, thiol derivative, this glutathione, uh, it attaches to electrophiles and that's often a, a uh, detoxifies electrophiles because electrophiles do nasty stuff and they, they will, um, you know, potentially attach to your DNA and cause genotoxicity, things like that. Uh, methyl, so methylation is one of the things that can happen and that happens to hydroxy groups NH2 and thiols and also acetyl which uh, attaches to alcohols and amines. So each of these has a cofactor and um, I, you know, I don't think it's useful to memorize these but just to, just to understand the reactions 
nothing's magic. Everything, ha- you know, happens with a very specific um, uh, biological cofactor. And certainly the attachment of these molecules requires a very specific thing. So, for example, for glucuronidation, uh, the this kind of uh, arrangement of of atoms her- occurs. Glucuronide is the glucose thing with the carboxylic acid and the numbering system, I believe, is uh, this is the one position or, or one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime, six prime. And Anyway, the glucuronide is attached to this uridine diphosphate group. And this is really a leaving group. The whole right side is a leaving group. So uh, in it, with assistance of an enzyme, uh, your substrate kind of attacks this position, and this gets kicked off. Now, it's not necessarily an SN2 type thing. Uh, I think the oxygen, this oxygen kind of helps kick it off, and then there's a carbocation type thing as an intermediate. And then, but the net result is your your molecule gets attached at the at the one prime position. The cofactor name is uridine five prime diphosphate. It's supposed to be an alpha D glucuronic acid, and or UTPGA. So the, this the cofactor has this crazy name, and the functional groups again are alcohols, amines, primary amines, secondary amines, thiols, and you, what's weird is. CH can actually be a reactive functional group. It's unusual because you don't think of CH as usually being a nucleophile. Okay, and and then sulfate. Sulfate kind of looks similar, except it's not a uridine, it's an adenosine, and it's, just, it's not two phosphates, it's one phosphate. Um, but then we have a sulfate on this, attached on this uh, phosphate, and uh, the... Um, now it's kind of like this this right side adenosine monophosphate thing is the leaping group. So this is the three prime phosphoadenosine, five prime phosphosulfate, PAPS. And this is used to uh, sulfonate hydroxy groups in the amines. Here's glutathione, and so glutathione is kind of like an, a cofactor in itself. It doesn't need like a leaving group because it's actually a nucleophile itself. The thiol is, and remember, this is a, a, a major component of cells. There's, a, I forgot, like something like twenty percent of the soluble material in the cell, or, or some large number. So this this is present in, in massive quantities in the cell because it's really used to clean up messes and electrophilic species that can really destroy a cell and, and uh, kill, kill, well, kill the cell and cause genotoxicity. Glutathione, GSH. And this is used to uh, scavenge electrophiles, whether it's an alkyl halide, epoxides, other things that can be easily attacked, like glutathione attacks. Okay, so for acetylation, no, this is for uh, uh, glycine and glutamine, I'm sorry. So in, uh, what happens uh, roughly and sort of mechanistically is your drug will have a carbonyl and it'll, it'll be conjugated with coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is a leaving group. So glutamine or glycine has a nucleophilic NH2 and that can attack and kick this thing off. And that's kind of how how they happen. So we, we don't, again, we don't have like a leaving group on this species. It's actually just a, just a nucleophile. But your drug needs to be conjugated with coenzyme A. Okay, so the cofactor name is glycine or glutamine. And it really uh, conjugates carboxylic acids. Uh, the, this is acetyl. And for acetylation, this is an acetyl group. And and in the case of acetyl, it has the coenzyme A on it also as a leaving group. And and uh, your, your drug, being a nucleophile, like an NH2 or something, would attack and kick off the leaving group. So the cofactor name is acetyl coenzyme A, or acetyl CoA, sometimes people call it. And this is used also for alcohols and amines. Oops. 
Okay, so for uh, methylation as a met metabolic reaction, uh, we have uh, this kind of weird cofactor. There's the methyl group, and the methyl group is attached to this whole thing, which is a leaving group. The red thing is the leaving group. So what is this molecule? Well, here's uh, adenosine also. So there's adenosine, and it what, what this is called is S adenosyl methionine. So methionine, of course, is just the left part of the molecule, and the, the amino acid methionine. So there's methionine, right? Methionine as an amino acid has adenosyl attached to it. And that's why we call it S adenosyl methionine. S adenosyl methionine. And so S adenosyl methionine is a cofactor that has pretty much one specific purpose in all of biochemistry, and that's to attach methyl groups to things. So uh, anytime a methyl group is attached in a molecule, whether it's in, in drug metabolism or or like you know DNA methylation or other natural processes in the body, we always use S adenosyl methionine. So when you think like in organic chemistry terms, you know what what is the organic chemical version of this of acetyl S CoA? The organic chemical version of this is acetic anhydride or acetyl chloride. So you can look at the, look at the structures, but it's basically, you know, in the in the lab we would have a chlorine on an acetyl group, and that would be a, a good leaving group. So this is a biological leaving group, CoA. In the case of this bottom thing, what's the organic chemical version of this? Well, may, it might be methyl iodide or iodomethane or, or something like that, methyl sulfate. Uh, things where methyl uh, has a a good easy leaving group, right? Iodide is a good one. So in biological systems, that's well, the, you know, biology does what it wants to do, and and this is kind of the evolved leaving group for biochemistry. S adenosyl methionine, the S adenosyl methionine, which is the uh, cofactor for methylation of biological molecules. And this methylates alcohols, amines, and thiols. Okay, so let's talk about glucuronide conjugation now, which is the attachment of that kind of glucose-looking um, thing with the carboxylic acid. Here's an example. Uh, nortriptyline, which is an antidepressant, has a secondary amine down here, and... This is a, of the tricyclic antidepressant variety. So P450 will do phase one metabolism to introduce a alkyl alcohol, a secondary alcohol right here. And then, uh, and then using the enzyme and the cofactor, um, this conjugates glucuronic acid to the alcohol. So there's the acid we're talking about, and this is the final product, the glucuronide conjugate. Okay, so uh, in terms of the mechanism of glucuronide uh, formation, it's pretty well understood. Um, <coughs> you start with this uh, glucose 1-phosphate derivative, and remember the uh, numbering system starts at the carbon right there. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this is basically just glucose with a phosphate at the one position. And um, what happens is, it is in the first step, it, it utilizes an enzyme called phosphorylase. And what it's pretty interesting how this works. It takes uridine triphosphate, which is essentially this compound, which would be uridine diphosphate, but with an extra phosphate on it. And somehow it, it looks like uh, this uh, phosphate is actually being a nucleophile, which is kind of weird, and it's kicking off uh, two of the phosphates from uridine triphosphate. So this is, you know, I'm not exactly sure how phosphorylase works, but something like that. And the outcome is um, uh, two phosphates, and 
then uh, glucuronic acid is as essential, or sorry, glucose. Glucose is essentially attached to uh, make this molecule. So now we have glucose, glucose, two phosphates, and um, and then uh, you know this is a, a uracil uh, uridine uh, compound. Okay. All right, so then um, we still need to oxidize the uh, alcohol to a carboxylic acid, and um, in order to, order to do that, we need an uh, oxidizing cofactor, and so that now we're using NAD+, and this is UDPG dehydrogenase. So this uh, enzyme is catalyzing the oxidation of the primary alcohol to the carboxylic acid. And you should know that um, NAD plus is sort of the oxidizing cofactor, or also NADP plus, and those are used in different situations. Okay, so now we have our carboxylic acid, and, and then the actual conjugation reaction occurs with this enzyme, UDP, UDP glucouronosal transferase. So now the, um, the uh, X group, the whatever uh, alcohol or uh, carboxylic acid or, or nitrogen, amine, uh, kicks off essentially uh, uridine diphosphate to give our final glucuronide product. Uh, some diseases are actually caused by deficiency of this last enzyme, UDP glucuronosal transferase, uh, uh, Krigler-Najjar syndrome, and Gilbert disease. Um, and so most adults actually have a functional UDP glucurono glucuronosal transferase. Interestingly, also neonates, which are newborn babies, have underdeveloped activity of this enzyme, or, or it's you know the enzyme is not present in in the quantities that adults have, and can suffer from toxic effects due to accumulation of drugs. Because you know this is a kind of a detoxifying mechanism for drugs that that um, humans use, and there's a, a syndrome called gray baby syndrome, uh, specifically that's caused by uh, chloramphenicol, which is an antibacterial drug. And here's a, yeah, this is a, actually used as an eye ointment, for example, and all other kind of a, uh, anti uh, bacterial type of activities. Okay? So, yeah, the, uh, this is sometimes not, not present in children or, or like early, uh, you know, new, newborn uh, infants. And also some adults also have a, a, a defect in this system and they, there's some diseases associated with that. Okay, so what are the functional groups that glucuronide attaches to? Let's go through some of them. Uh, conjugation to oxygen. So of course you can imagine alcohols getting glucuronides and Tylenol is a classic example of this. This is actually a phenol, so an aromatic alcohol. Chloramphenicol, 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 that's it. Um, this is a primary alcohol. This is the one we just saw, and this is glucuronated uh, in, in adults, maybe not in, in uh, young children. Phenoprefen, which is kind of like ibu ibuprofen, sorry, phenoprofen, phenoprofen, which is kind of like ibuprofen. It's an NSAID drug, uh, painkiller, uh, cyclooxygenase inhibitor. What are some of the things that uh, the nitrogen-containing molecules that get glucuronidated? Uh, secondary amines like desipramine, so this amine position can get a glucuronidation. Uh, this is a carbamate functional group, so this is kind of like an amide with an extra oxygen, and, and these are not necessarily the best nucleophiles because the nitrogen is talking to the oxygen, but it uh, these these do get glucuronidated also. Uh, Sulfadimethoxine, which is a 
sulfa drug, one, one of those things that inhibits bacterial uh, PABA turnover to make folates. And it actually acts like PABA. Remember PABA is paramino uh, benzoic acid. So this thing kind of acts like a benzoic acid. Anyway, uh, and, and there are antibiotics, antibiotics. So the sulfa antibiotics have a sulfonamide and the sulfonamide nitrogen is actually nucleophilic because it's very easily deprotonated. The PK is kind of low. But anyway, these are uh, readily uh, glucuronidated. Conjugation to sulfur, which is also a nucleophilic atom. Um, thiols like methim methimazole, um, essentially an imidazole derivative with a uh, thiol on it. That can be attached with glucuronidate. This is disulfiram, which is also called antabuse. It's a it's used in, in a treatment of uh, uh, alcohol addiction. And what happens is actually it, it's it's uh, administered as a disulfide. So the, the the original drug is a disulfide that gets reductively cleaved, probably by P450 and NADPH, and that makes the thiol and and the uh, glucuronidation can occur on the thiol sulfur. So yeah, each of the arrows again suggests where the glucuronidate goes. Interestingly, conjugation to carbon sounds pretty crazy because usually carbon is not very nucleophilic and nor is it acidic. So each of these functional groups is, you know, a, kind of a classical nucleophile and uh, the protons are relatively acidic also. So it's a little surprising that you could have conjugation to carbon. And anyway, uh, phenylbutazone is a drug that does have a semi-acidic hydrogen, a CH right there. So the pKa is about 4.5, and so this actually does gl get glucuronidated as well. Um, interestingly, you know, you can draw this as this sort of dicarbonyl tautomer, so the two carbonyls, uh, and e even though they're both amides, it's like an amide and an amide, um, you can, and we call those tautomers, if you remember from organic chemistry, uh, keto. So this is a keto tautomer, and this is a keto tautomer. Uh, they're not ketone functional groups. They look closer to amide functional groups. But the tautomer is called a ketone. Anyway, when you have two keto tautomers like this next door with a central carbon, you can actually uh, draw a uh, alternate tautomer form called the enol. So that would be an alkene right there and an alcohol there. I, I don't have it in my slide here. But you can envision what that looks like, right? This would be keto, and this would be an enol, so alkene, alcohol. Well, enols are nucleophilic, right? And that could explain also why we get glucuronidation at the, at the carbon position. So you could probably draw that out if you like. And it's an equilibrium, right? This is an equilibrium arrow to the keto, from keto-keto to keto-enol, tautomer. Okay, some examples of, more examples of these phase two transformations. Here's a sulfate conjugation. So we did glucuronidation. Now let's talk about sulfate. Okay, so one example is albuterol, uh, which is a bronchodilator, often used in uh, inhalers. This gets um, uh, transformed to the sulfate on the phenol functional group. And interestingly, it's, it's not totally clear why, but it, it, this is selective for the phenol and the uh, the uh, primary alcohol and the secondary alcohol, and also the amine do not react. So sometimes sulfonation is, is uh, selective to react with phenols, and this is a case where that's true. Um, sometimes sulf sulfate conjugation competes with glucuronidation. That's kind of interesting. And uh, one example is actually acetaminophen, which uh, has, a, has a phenol on it. And in adults, where we have nice glucuronidation machinery and the enzymes uh, and the cofactors, uh, this actually, um, uh, the phenol gets glucuronidated. So that there's a glucuronidation. Uh, we also get detectable levels of sulfate 
But in a, in a neonate uh, or young child between three and nine years old, they don't necessarily have uh, glucuronidation machinery. And so this, they actually get sulfate formation on the phenol. So in both cases, these are excreted and you know, they're both viable metabolic routes. It's just um, that in the case of uh, young children who do not have uh, functional glucuronidation uh, enzymes and, and the cofactors, uh, sulfate actually competes and is used instead. Okay, mechanism of sulfate conjugation is pretty straightforward. So, inorganic sulfate, which is SO4 2 minus, uh, reacts with ATP, and this is another case, kind of like we we what we saw um, a second ago. It's almost like the if you imagine ATP, which is the adenosine triphosphate, it's this with three phosphates, right? So phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. This seems to be attacking the first phosphate and kicking off a PPI, which is the, the second two phosphates. There's an enzyme being used, ATP sulfur sulfurylase, and magnesium is involved also. But this is a kind of a weird reaction also because this is not really known as a nucleophile, but something, you know, maybe the enzyme is doing some magic that's allowing it to be a nucleophile. Anyway, so then you have uh, sulfate attached to uh, adenosine monophosphate. And then uh, this bottom phosphate gets um, phosphorylated uh, by this kinase, APS. Uh, I think, I'm not sure what APS stands for, but it's a phosphokinase. And it's... Um, Basically, transferring a phosphate from ATP, which is being, which is creating ADP, to uh, this position, which is the th the three prime uh, hydroxy group. One, two, three, four, five. So the three prime hydroxy group is getting phosphorylated, and this is the final cofactor that's used in um, uh, sulfonating. Uh, compounds and drugs. So now RXH, which is your uh, drug, attacks in the nucleophilic uh, atom. It could be a, you know nitrogen or oxygen would attack sulfur and kick this off as a leaving group. So this whole thing falls off as a leaving group, and that makes this a PAP, which is sort of the uh, the final product. And then our product has a sulfonate on it. Okay, so it's a pretty straightforward biochemical mechanism how, how sulfate ion gets eventually transferred onto your drug. R is the drug. In mammals, this occurs less frequently than other forms of metabolism, mostly because we don't have a ton of sulfate floating around in our bodies. Uh, sulfate is not a, a high abundance ion. Glycine con con conjugation. So this also happens uh, with glutamine. So glycine can conjugate onto drugs as well. And, and it, it usually go attaches to carboxylic acids, right? We saw that. So you have a, a drug with a carboxylic acid. Glycine or glutamine will get conjugated onto it as a phase two transformation. Here's a case where we're starting with bromphenyramine. Bromphenyramine is an antihistamine drug. And there's no carboxylic acids here. So that's weird. How's this going to work? How are we going to conjugate a glycine or glutamine to this if there's no carboxylic acids? Well, uh, what happens is uh, P450 does an oxidative uh, demethylation reaction. Remember how that worked? So the methyl would get hydroxylated oxidatively, and then the oxygen would kick off and kick off the nitrogen, and then you would do it again. Uh, you would uh, hydroxylate the other methyl, and then the oxygen would kick in and kick off, and you end up with a primary amine. And then this, in the, this molecule, it's a pretty extensive metabolic process. Now P450 will react again and cause deamination, so loss of NH3. How does that happen? How does P450 deaminate this amine? Well, it does the same exact thing it did 
over here, right? Over here, we uh, hydroxylated the uh, carbon and then the oxygen kicked off. Well, in this case, P450 hydroxylates this position, right? Where the nitrogen is, hydroxylates it, and then oxygen kicks off the nitrogen, and then we're left with an aldehyde. So now we're left with an aldehyde here. And then the enzyme aldehyde dehydroxygenase is a, basically an oxidation enzyme. I think there may be some NAD plus or NADP plus in there also as a cofactor. But this is an oxidation now where uh, the aldehyde gets oxidized up to a carboxylic acid. Okay, so now we have our carboxylic acid. This is where like glycine acyl transferase would happen. Uh, remember that... Um, what are you know? There's steps to this, and wha the main thing is that tr you got to turn this into a good leaving group. So just like in normal organic chemistry, this is a bad leaving group, right? We learned this in chemistry that you can't kick off an OH; it's a bad leaving group. Well, just in, as well in biochemistry, this needs to be turned into a good leaving group. Do you guys remember what the good leaving group was? It was uh, the uh, coenzyme A coenzyme A, so it's a COA thing, and that's basically a, a good biological leaving group for carbonyls. Anyway, so glycine or glutamine, uh, with the help of an enzyme, kick off the CoA uh, version. All right? Another thing that can happen with um, these tertiary amines is oxidation with FMO to the N oxide. So we saw that earlier. And this is a pretty well-behaved reaction. You get this. And it, uh, it often can be excreted directly. This is a polar intermediate. It's N plus O minus. The mechanism uh, is pretty straightforward. So this, the, like we were just saying, that you got to make the oxygen a good leaving group. Well, what happens is y your drug, carboxylic acid, reacts with acyl-CoA synthase. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. We're synthesizing a CoA derivative, acyl co coenzyme A derivative. And in order to do this, we take ATP and we uh, it kicks off two phosphates to make uh, PPI. And and then that now essentially AMP is attached, so adenosine monophosphate. So it, what this is, is is a phosphorus and then adenosine, right? Okay, so then this now is a initial leaving group. And now we're going to convert it to leaving group number two. So coenzyme A, SH, will attack the carbon, kick off AMP, and now we have our acyl coenzyme A derivative. And then the, glu the amino acid, glycine or glutamine, it has nucleophilic NH2, and that attacks leaving group number two, kicks it off, kicks off S uh, coenzyme A. And that's in the, with the assistance of the amino acid and acyl transferase. Okay, so we go from bad leaving group to leaving group number one to leaving group number two, and then the nitrogen kicks off the leaving group number two with assistance of an enzyme, amino acid and acyl transferase. All right, glutathione conjugation. Glutathione conjugation. <laughs> So we know about glutathione, it's a um, tripeptide with a non-standard connection of the amino acids, right? It's not, because like, a normal, uh, in, this is a glutamic acid, right? Glutamic acid. And in a normal peptide, we wouldn't be connected um, to the, uh, the, the carboxylic acid would not be um, connected through the side chain to the peptide. Uh, normally, we'd go off the main chain carboxylic acid. So that would be like the standard connection like that we see in proteins, right? So this is a little weird because the glutamic acid is, uh, you know, the connectivity is different. This is a cysteine amino acid, cysteine. This is a glycine, okay? So... And it is like a, kind of like a mini peptide where you go from N-terminus to C-terminus. And here's the N-terminus, here's the C-terminus. The only weirdness is that we're connecting off the, the side chain uh, carboxylic acid. Okay, so it's, but the main thing about glutathione is it's a nucleophilic scavenger, loves to attack things, lo loves to attack electrophiles. 
Here is an example of it, and it, and it uses an enzyme called glutathione S transferase. Even though it's actually a pretty good nucleophile already, um, and if you're reacting with a good electrophile, it shouldn't need much work. So this enzyme doesn't do a whole lot. Uh, I think it probably helps maybe deprotonate this to make it a, <coughs> a better nucleophile. Anyway, so uh, busulfan, which is a myleran, it's a leukemia drug. There's actually a DNA uh, alkylator, and we usually know these to be super toxic, right? <laughs> this is like iodomethane or something, right? The, these sulfates are good leaving groups. So we have a good leaving group on the left, a good leaving group on the right. And so if this was, you know, you could imagine a drug would all, could also be like butane, one for uh, butane, uh, one for diiodobutane, right? If we had iodines on these, it'd be kind of a similar thing. And those are, alkyl halides are super toxic and uh, attack DNA. Atta yeah, DNA attacks them and it alkylates DNA. Anyway, so uh, glutathione uh, sees this as a as a foe and it wants to uh, detoxify it. As a drug, this, ad this actually acts by alkylating DNA. We often uh, use kinase inhibitors nowadays, but there are cases where we use alkylating um, substances for, for cancer treatment. The idea though is you wouldn't take this orally you know, or even IV, this is going to destroy your um, body non-selectively, right? It's going to alkylate your proteins, alkylate your DNA, because it's a very uh, prone to electrophile. Anyway, you might put, you might inject this directly into a tumor site. Like if you have a a tumor that's growing, this would be a drug that would be a pretty pretty um, exhaustive treatment that would uh, really stop tumor growth because you're alkylating everything. Anyway, glutathione detoxifies this by attacking it kind of as an SN2 reaction with the help of glutathione, glutathione S transferase. And then it's interesting because now you have this stuff, um, this leaving group is still on here for the, 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 the other leaving group, and you have glutathione attached. So there's a the sulfur. G means kind of the rest of glutathione. Well, the sulfur is still actually a nucleophile. Even if it's a sulfide, it can, it's still a nucleophile. And so now the sulfur swings down and attacks this carbon, kicks off the other leaving group. And now we have this weird cyclic glutathione conjugate thing, and it's very polar, it's positively charged, easily excreted. So this is an interesting case of how glutathione would uh, react uh, with this drug. Okay, and another thing that glutathione reacts with are substrates uh, that can undergo a SNAR mechanism, which is nucleophilic aromatic substitution. <coughs> this was mentioned in your Organic 2 book, uh, in Organic 2 class, probably somewhere near the end, and we, we've mentioned it s maybe once in the class. Uh, we call it SNAR. SNAR. Uh, the idea is that glutathione and other nucleophiles can kind of attack an aromatic ring uh, with a leaving group on it this, and, and kick off the leaving group. This only happens if the, um, well, if you have some kind of Z group on the molecule, which could be an electron withdrawing group, something to, to accept a negative charge. So, you know, when we teach this in organic two, we usually say like a paranitro group, NO2. And um, anyway, uh, yeah, something something has to accept the charge essentially, and then and then what happens is that this attacks, electrons get pushed to the to form the negative charge on the opposite side of the ring, and then the negative charge swings back, kicks off the leaving group, and then you have this kind of thing. So that's a kind of how SNAR works, and I always make the joke, uh, usually in organic one or organic two about it being uh, the pirate's favorite reaction, uh, s the SNAR reaction, because that's what pirates always say is R. Okay, so here's an example of glutathione metabolism uh, kicking off a leaving group through a SNAR mechanism. So this is azathioprine, which I am not exactly sure what this does, but it kind of looks like an adenosine, uh, some kind of adenosine analog. Anyway, um, so yeah, the glutathione uh, attacks this uh, carbon, 
kicks the double bond uh, towards the neighboring nitro group. So electrons attack, double bond goes towards the nitro, nitro accepts the negative charge, and then O minus swings back, reforms the double bond, and then breaks off this thing, which is actually the leaving group in this case, this, this heterocycle. And then you get your conjugate. So that's a, that's a weird um, alternate type of glutathione conjugation through the SNAR reaction. Okay. And then this is the leaving group. And so, yeah, when we usually teach SNAR, we just sort of assume a paranitro group maybe on the back of the, uh, the para position of where the leaving group is. Glutathione can also conjugate to uh, molecules via conjugate addition. So it's conjugation via conjugate addition. What's conjugate addition? It's, it's usually when you have like one functional group next to another functional group, often like an alkene next to a ketone or something like that. And this is a, sort of a general idea of what, you know, what a conjugate addition is. And we often call this a Michael reaction. Uh, I think a formal Michael r usually requires a enolate nucleophile attacking a this thing. We call this a alpha beta unsaturated ketone because you have a a bond between the alpha carbon and the beta carbon, a double bond. Alpha beta unsaturated ketone, right? Al alpha beta unsaturated ketone. Well, anyway, so the the reaction is a two step process where the nucleophile attacks. The carbon alkene shifts to make an enolate, and the enolate swings down, grabs a proton, and now you basically have a nucleophile attached to the beta carbon. So, conjugate addition. Sometimes it's uh, also called a Michael addition. And this is actually done. Uh, one of the metabolic processes for morphine does this exact thing. So. Um, here's morphine, and it's a you know pretty complicated uh, alkaloid opioid um, receptor agonist, and um, interestingly, our our bodies and mammals contain a pretty specific enzyme that oxidizes the alcohol to the ketone. It actually has a name called morphine six dehydrogenase, which dehydrogenases are also called oxidases, they are, are, are cause, cause oxidation, right? So this weird mammalian enzyme, which is very specific and it kind of, you know, we have an evolved enzyme in our bodies that accepts morphine, which is like a naturally occurring product <laughs> as a substrate. It's uh, kind of, uh, I, I don't know the full story of this enzyme, but I'm kind of surprised by this. Anyway, you get a ketone. Ah, look at that. Now we have a uh, alpha beta unsaturated uh, ketone, right? We have a ketone with a, a double bond between the alpha and the beta carbons. And now glutathione, uh, SG, or, or GSH, is a nucleophile, and it does a conjugate addition off the, uh, onto the beta carbon of this, this functional group, and you get this as your uh, excretable... Um, phase two drug conjugate. It's kind of cool. Another thing that can happen actually occurs on the other side of the molecule, up on this phenol, the benzene with the alcohol on it. So this can undergo P450 oxidation to make this, which is yet another kind of, not only is it an alpha beta, I think it's actually an alpha beta gamma delta <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, I don't know what you'd even call that, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. It says alpha, beta, unsaturated, gamma, delta, unsaturated, ketone. So it's got two double bonds, two double bonds that are conjugated with the ketone, and that's that can be accepted as an electrophile. Uh, how does this actually work? I, you know, I, my guess is that P450 is doing what P450 loves to do, which is simply hydroxylating an active... Uh, CH and activated TH. So this position is activated for hydroxylation because of the benzene. And you know, if, if this plucked, if this is a CH2, one of the H's gets plucked off. You get a radical. 
now the radical can delocalize through this system and be a very stabilized radical. So the radical there is stabilized by a bunch of resonance structures. So that's like an organic one resonance problem. You could draw that, draw a radical, and then you can delocalize the radical into um, a new radical, which should be right there. You'd have a double bond, a new radical. Anyway, so that explains why you get hydroxylation there, yeah? why you get hydroxylation there. Well, once you have hydroxylation there, then this oxygen basically swings in, kicks the double bonds through, and then kicks off the OH. So then the OH is gone. And what do you got? Now you have this. So this is the uh, substrate for glutathione, and now glutathione attacks that position. It, it could attack either this position or this position, and uh, they're both electrophilic. And I guess in you know, uh, maybe with, with glutathione as transferase, the enzyme, it seems to go after this position. And attacks, kicks electrons all the way back, and essentially reforms the phenol, and now you have an, uh, glutathione right there. So that's kind of interesting as an alternative metabolic route for morphine. Another thing that happens with glutathione is... Uh, transformation of glutathione, uh, glutathione conjugate to N-acetyl cysteine conjugate. Uh, I actually have to stop now. I'm going to continue this next time, and and w then we're going to jump into prodrugs, which is our kind of new uh, next topic, which is going to be really fun. Um, but anyway, what we'll see next time is that glutathione uh, conjugates. Uh, can be converted to a different kind of conjugate and that that uh, kind of saves some of the amino acids from being excreted and it's kind of an inefficient process. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about this one next time. All right, have a wonderful weekend, guys.